Well, so good to be with you, fam. Good to see you guys. My name's Larry, one of the lead pastors here. Hi, schoolers, what's up? I see you. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> We're here. If you're with us online, so glad you're with us online. Um, would love to invite you during the service um, to grab some elements. At the end of this service today, we're going to uh, wrap up our time together with communion. <clears throat> so if you want to take a moment or two, grab some elements so you can participate. Those of you who are in the room, we're going to walk you through that uh, in just a little bit. Um, it was a good weekend. Uh, like It was really exciting to hear about our missional updates and Unleashing Compassion and how literally uh, communities around the world are being changed through your generosity and the work um, of the people around all over the world. Uh, I know that a handful of you actually participated even yesterday in Walk for Water. That was so awesome to see. Uh, people were raising money for that. Yep, I saw those pictures. Um, so it's really cool. So thankful to be part of a community that's unleashing compassion and giving of their time, their talents, and their resources when it comes to their finances to bring not only awareness to, but actually good works um, to these different places all over the world. So we have been in a conversation walking through the book of Matthew, if you're new with us, uh, which is the first book in the New Testament. It is the, called one of the four gospels. This is the good news of Jesus and the life and story of him. So we have chosen Matthew, and we're literally walking verse by verse, um, one at a time. And so we're taking our time going through this and unpacking and seeing what we can grasp from this. And we created a resource, uh, a journal for you. So if you're new with us, we have this as a gift to you. You can grab at the New Friends area as you leave today. Uh, it tells you what we're talking about each week, tells you what we've talked about, what's coming up. Also some space to take some notes and uh, just to understand where we're going. So we wanna give that as a gift to you. So as you leave today, I'll remind you at the end of the service, but you can grab that. If you have that with you today, we're on page 129, um, and today's topic is the Lord's Prayer, part one. So some of you guys are like, man, last week was a teaser. We did eight verses last week. I mean, we did so much, uh, and this week we're going to do two, so it's going to be great. <laughs> The Lord's Prayer, part one. Many of you are familiar with the Lord's Prayer, whether you grew up in church or not. Some of you maybe even didn't grow up in church or didn't attend church on a regular basis, but you were taught the Lord's Prayer uh, or you even recited it. You memorized it and weren't necessarily always sure what you were saying or why you were saying it. It just became like a rhythm and a routine. And the way scholars have broken down the Lord's Prayer is it's broken into three parts that it's focused on um, teaching us, which is number one, adoration, that we give God, we adore him uh, and talk about who he is. Then there's admitting um, that uh, uh, I've, I've done wrongs or I have transgressions. And then there's asking, that we're asking for daily bread and forgiveness. And what we tend to focus on the most, can you guess, out of these, some of you guys are geeking out right now. You're like, this, they're, they all start with A's. I'm never gonna forget that. Thank you for the journal and thank you for A's. Adoration, admitting, and asking. What are we focused on the most? Asking, for sure. How much do we love that? We're, we don't even like do the adoration part. We're like, um, God, and then that's how we start. God, I need this. And we go, bam, 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 just our list of the things that we need, the things that we want, the things that we expect. And we're just really good at that part. But we're gonna tease out that that is not the primary aspect and that there really is a certain way that we're supposed to do this because this is how Jesus taught us. So last week, we started in chapter six. And in chapter six, Jesus was teasing out this religious uh, righteousness that when we act out, that when we're a follower of God, that there are things that we do. And then he gave, uh, that there are things that we do, and he gave kind of the heart behind it. That right off the bat, you need to understand that the heart behind the things that you do, your actions should be right. They should be righteous. They should be to give God glory and that others may see your good deeds for his glory. But we can find ourselves, he says, beware, be careful. You can find yourselves uh, in a place where you're looking for the accolades, that you're putting on a show, that you're a hypocrite. And so he gave two examples. One was when you give, not if you give, but when you're generous. This is uh, how you do it and how you don't do it. Don't do it to make this public thing. But uh, when, it's, uh, when your right hand doesn't know what your left hand's doing and you're doing it out of the right heart, that when God sees what's done in secret, he gives a reward. But the reward you get from man, that's as good as it gets. And then he gave the example of prayer and, and how people pray and they're trying to look like better than and like super um, spiritual and this great connection with God and even babbling with big, you know, vernacular and words. And it's just to put on a show. 
And he's saying, be careful, you need to adjust where your heart is. And then we pick up today in verse nine. He then responds, this then is how you should pray. Right off the bat, I ask the question, why? Like, why then now is he gonna say, this is how you should pray? And so when you tease that out, we come up with, I think, a couple answers. The first one is this, we love experiences. Like, we love to go on experiences, we love to experience other things. How many of you guys love experiences? Yeah, for sure. You, we gift that way now, right? We don't even give someone a gift for them to experience something on their own. You're like, no, we're gonna do it together. I'm coming with you because I don't wanna miss out, right? It's kind of like the two for one, like, wait a minute, I can give myself a gift at the same time? This is excellent. Hope you're enjoying me, right? <laughs> But that's how, we, that's how we, we gift this way. And that's, we love experiences. We love um, doing new adventures. Or we love like leaning in all the way to, gas, to grasp everything that an experience has to give us. So we love experiences. And what Jesus is starting to tell us right now is this then is how you pray. It's a reflection of this then is how you actually experience God. Prayer is actually how you experience the creator of the universe, that when you want to experience the supernatural, this is actually what you do, and this is where this relationship starts and it is fostered. Secondly, I think the, the clearest way to explain it when he says this then is how you pray, and we ask why do we need to know how to pray, is fundamentally because we just don't know how to pray. Like, we don't know how to do it. We don't understand it. Maybe we've watched someone uh, maybe we've looked a little bit into someone teaching us how to pray. And so we need to learn because the real reality is, is you're not good at it. So now I have to come up here and teach you about what he says so you can be better at it. No, here's the reality. I'm not good at it either. And a lot of you guys think like, oh, you know, you're like the pastor. So you're like really good at praying, Right. That's not the case. It's like the worst. I'll go in like to events and hang out and, and someone like gives me the side eye and they're like, oh, the pastor's here. You want to give us a little prayer? And I'm like, what? Why has it always got to be me? Like if this was your idea, you do it, right? And also there's no little prayer. Like there's no little prayer. You're literally talking to the creator of the universe, the God of the universe. And you're like, hey, just throw one out there, huh? right? It's bigger than that. It's like heavier than that, Right? And we just don't know how to do it. I don't, I'm, I'm not that great at it either. I can tell you right now that I could pick five topics like right this second and I could talk about them for 30 minutes, no problem. I could preach about them for 30 minutes, no big deal. But you ask me to spend 30 minutes going somewhere else and to pray for 30 minutes, I'd be like, Ugh, right? I think a lot of you would be the same way. I could, I could ask you for three. There's like three things that you're passionate about, you're good at, you're excited about. And I say, like, you could talk, what are the three things you could talk about for like 30 minutes straight at the drop of a hat? You'd be able to knock them out. You'd be like, this, this, and this. But if I said, hey, so like you're a follower of Jesus, you're a follower of God, can you go pray for 30 minutes? A lot of you would be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> that wasn't on my list of three there, buddy, right? So we need to learn. There's this implication right off the bat that he's saying, this then is how you should pray because we haven't gotten something right. Like they weren't getting it right. We are missing then how this is supposed to happen. So he continues, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Right off the bat, this is where a lot of you get like uh, a -car a -a archaic with your language. This is when I hear everyone turn into like a British person or something. It's always like our Father who art in heaven. It's like you don't even talk like that. What do you mean art in heaven? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Right off the bat, we see we have a heavenly Father. And if you think about the word Father or what a Father represents, is, it, is intimate. Now, what I'm not gonna do right now is get into a long piece about some of us who have had difficulties with our earthly fathers, which is what a lot of us attach it to because we look at this person and we're saying, they're supposed to be this. If Father represents this, this is what it's supposed to be. And what happens is we all get let down. I let down my, my kids. Like, I'm just not gonna be that thing. But what, what, when you do it right, the most powerful things that you hear from a father is you can do it, as far as encouragement goes. I believe in you, and I love you. 
It's this intimacy that Jesus is saying already collectively on your behalf that we have a father who cares, who encourages, who protects, who guides, who loves. So he's making it not this just the God of the universe, which is what he is, but all of a sudden it's making him approachable by saying, our father, we have a father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Underline hallowed right there. This word right here, is that's the part of adoration, adoring, saying we have a father and he is mighty, he is holy, he is set apart, be your name. This is, this is a really important piece, I think, that helps us understand right off the bat that names are important. Names are really important. Um, I know that um, uh, I was named after two of my uncles, Lawrence, my uncle whose name is Lawrence, and another uncle named Scott. So that's my first and middle name. <clears throat> and uh, like for my kids, my oldest daughter, her name is Madeline. Um, her first name, she was named after Madeline, uh, goes with Mary Magdalene who was the, one of the first disciples of Jesus that followed him all the way through his crucifixion and then was the first to experience him as a resurrected Lord and Savior and then gave that first gospel message. And she's, so she's our Madeline. Her middle name is Nicole because my sister's middle name is Nicole. My wife's uh, sister's middle name is Nicole. So there's some identity with the family. So she gets to be a Nicole. Our oldest son, Malachi, whom we adopted from Ethiopia, Africa, his given name was Isierdao. Isierdao DeWitt was his name. And uh, the Isierdao means, may God be with you on your travels or your journey. And this was because his grandfather, when he took him to the orphanage, gave him this name of Isierdao because he knew he wouldn't be with him because his uh, um, daughter died in childbirth. And so he didn't have a mother, and he said, I can't take care of him. And so he journeyed on. And so then he was Isierdao DeWitt. And so when we got to meet... Um, E.C. Erdow, we said that's not, not that easy in preschool in the United States, so <clears throat> we're going to help a brother out. And uh, so he's our Malachi, and Malachi is, means messenger of God. He's a messenger of God, and so for us personally, he was our message from God to adopt, and our family changed, and our identity changed as a family, and then our prayer and hope is that he continues to be a messenger of God, and that is adopted into this larger family, and what that represents in the gospel. His middle name is DeWitt. Um, that's because, uh, and it means David or beloved. You know, we kept that. His last name is his middle name because he's got identity. He came from somewhere. Our youngest daughter, Elsie. Um, she's named after her grandparents, her grandmas, uh, Lila, Lila and Carolyn. And so it's L-C. I wanted to spell it like that, L-C. I thought it was super cool and hip. It'd be easier in preschool. My wife said no. Um, but there's, there's identity in that. Our youngest son, who we, um, had, uh, we foster cared for him for the first couple of years of his life in Solano County, <clears throat> and then ended up adopting him. Uh, he's uh, Vietnamese and African-American and comes from like back east in the Georgia area down in Jamaica. And uh, when we first um, met him, uh, when he was seven days old, he was Nicholas Evans. He didn't have a middle name, Nicholas Evans. And so after spending time with him, he became Demetrius Evans as his middle name for identity. But Demetrius in 3 John uh, talks about how John says there's going to be a missionary that's going to come in through here and please welcome him into your house and take care of him because he's a bringer of the good news and the gospel. And so as we fostered him, we felt like that connected with him, that he was welcomed in our home and it was our job to take care of him as he was a representation of the gospel and everyone's included and cared for and loved. And so we got to keep then Evans uh, because he's got identity there. So names are important. I think Jesus is teaching us right off the bat that names are important. And I'm teaching you right now that a lot of you guys did a poor job naming your kids. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just messing around. If you want to name them pair, it's totally cool. I don't know what it means. Um, no, seriously, no shame in that. But there's, that, that there's importance to that. And some of us have been named after someone or something. And there's identity there. And some of us haven't. And there's actually some identity and connection there. But what I want to tell everyone is that we see this, that our Father, that we have a heavenly Father, or hallowed be your name, that there's importance to names that he's talking about, and there's connection and identity to this, and there's adoration to this, but our Father's name is set apart. It is holy. 
It says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom, your will be done. Circle your underline king and kingdom and then circle your and underline will. Your kingdom, this is your kingdom he's talking about, to earth, come to earth. Jesus is talking about a king, that there is a king of a kingdom. And this is the father. And a lot of times when we think about a kingdom, we think about like castles and moats and like knights, right? That's how we think about this. But the, the audience in which he was speaking to understood this very clearly, that there was actually a kingdom that would be coming. And this kingdom that was coming was actually at the end of time. This is when everything was gonna be reconciled. When the kingdom comes, Israel's gonna go out of exile, that there will be reconciliation, there'll be redemption. Um, there's gonna be a, 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 a healing ultimately of everything that's taken place. And Jesus is coming right out of the gate and he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. We saw this months ago. Uh, we saw this months ago when we learned about John the Baptist. These people knew of John the Baptist and who he was because he was saying, repent and be baptized for the kingdom of heaven is here. Jesus starts his ministry just before he starts his Sermon on the Mount. It says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. It's here on heaven as it is on earth. So it's, he's, he's essentially saying really clearly that when we're praying, we're not praying for this future tense. We're praying for the future to actually become and live in the present. Like it's taking place right here, right now. This isn't a future thing. That, that, that on the earth, there's an experience of heaven and it's taking place. In Philippians uh, 3.20, Paul reminds us of this because this is something that Jesus teaches all throughout his ministry, that we're actually people, that our citizenship is in heaven, that our citizenship, that we're actually kingdom people. This is this future tense. And part of our job as citizens or as citizens at this time was to take from wherever they were from and live it out to wherever they were local to. Uh, I had a, a great conversation weeks ago with a friend, and I'm sure you guys have done this too before, where you talk to someone new and you meet them, and they're like, oh, where are you from? And they'll kind of talk about where they're from, but it misses out a whole bunch of identity or, in reality, citizenship of, like, who they are and maybe where home was. So I'll give you an example just because I was talking about my son, Malachi. Malachi was born in Africa, in Ethiopia, that country. You ask Malachi now where he's from, he would tell you, I'm from Fairfield, California. That's where he's grown up the last 12 years. So most of his life, he's been here. But what it's missing is where his identity actually is. So what he is, is he's an Ethiopian young man that is local to Fairfield, California, and gets to live that out. So Paul's saying, and Jesus is saying, that our citizenship is in heaven. Where we are local to is here. And we're supposed to bring that identity, that citizenship, that thing out here in that place, wherever we're local to, and to live that out. That we are a part of the kingdom of God. And this is a future that's actually lived out in the presence, that we're actually supposed to embody and show what the future kingdom, what heaven is like here on the earth right now, that, that we're supposed to express this, that we're supposed to show others what that's like right now. So what we do to do that is we then start to shame other people, right? We start to bring guilt for not living away or not thinking the way I think. We give judgment. I have to show you what this looks like because you don't think the way, act the way, agree the way others around me think and agree and act. No. <laughs> but you can think of that person. Maybe you've been there. No, as kingdom workers, as bringers of the kingdom, as citizens of heaven, bringing our citizenship to be lived out in this place, what do we bring? Love. No racism. No hate. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Self-control. These are the things that we are called to and we are praying for. Your kingdom come. 
on earth as it is in heaven. God, would you use me? Your kingdom come in and through me here in this place. And then we get to experience the supernatural. We get to experience communion with the God of the universe. And that's what we get to bring. Now go back to the word your, your, your kingdom, your will, his, not ours. That's huge. Like if we can grasp that, there's a release here today that can happen. And that happens on a regular basis when we pray like this. Now this is your kingdom. That this is your will, not mine. And when we release that, when we grasp that and allow that tension to dissipate, it does something in us. It does something through us when we actually say your kingdom, because the problem is, is we love kingdom control, but it can kill you, like literally. I, um, I can tell you that um, this last year, this time, I was like riding on a knife's edge. Uh, everyone was kind of coming back uh, and gathering around. We were kind of discovering what it was like not to be in full-time timeout, right? But there was so much hurt. There was so much loss. There was so much anxiety and frustration and anger, and I was carrying it all. I needed to. Like, I'm pastor here. I, wanna, I love you. I'm going to care for you. You know, I'm trying to figure out, like, how, how do I help you actually fix this marriage that has deteriorated? How do I walk with you in the sickness that you just discovered and, and we can't even really talk about it yet? How do I, like, see you and grieve with you as you have experienced massive loss or loved ones that you didn't even get to have, like, a memorial service for? How do I help you catch up because you're behind on those bills so you, like, don't get kicked out of that place? Or how do I care for you because you lost a job right now or you might have to move somewhere. There's just so much stuff. And I felt like, oh my gosh, this is mine. This is me. Like, I got to do this. I got to carry you in. And I remember specifically, I was um, in a pool on a vacation last July, the end of it. And I was sitting there. And I don't know if you've ever been there, just carrying so much stuff that I was trying to rest. And I remember I, I was physically like telling myself out loud, why aren't you resting? You're supposed to be resting. This is rest. You're in a pool. <laughs> You're on vacation. See, rest. And then you're like feeling, nope, not rested. Carrying all that stuff. And it literally was in that moment, I gave that to God and I said, your kingdom, your will. Like, why am I carrying all this stuff? And what I realized is, you're not mine. You're not. You're his. And I get to pray with and I get to come alongside you and I get to be a kingdom worker with you and I get to care for and support you. But it's not my job to carry all this stuff. Like I'm in control of your kingdom and fixing it because I can't fix it all. I can support you. I can love you. I can guide you. I can see you, but I can't do it. And that was a huge release. And maybe some of you are sitting here today and I don't know what kind of kingdom you're carrying, but it's not yours. And you can sit there in a pool <laughs> And he'll say, yeah, you should give that to me and be like, yeah, I don't want it, but I feel like I should take it. And he's like, yeah, it's not yours. And then, voila, the peace is right there if you want it. You just have to take it. And we're so full of pride so often it's so difficult. The same goes with your kids. How many of us have like a kingdom and a household where like we're so stressed out because of our kids? I'm gonna tell you right now, those of us who grew up in the 80s and 90s, like the parents had the easiest parent job in the world, like, right? It was legit. They were like, get out of the house in the morning. And like the parenting was literally the streetlights. Streetlights are on, a parent must be around, right? <laughs> you could do anything you wanted to. You're like cruising along. You're like, oh yeah, you'll give me a ride. Your van doesn't have any windows. Awesome. And like, you're like, okay, cool. <laughs> you didn't even have to talk to your parents about what you did, right? That was just like the easy way to go. We couldn't imagine parenting like that right now. My friends who are in here are in their late 20s, early 30s. You are in the kid fog. Like you are deep into it. You're like, I don't even know what's going on right now. Like your whole day goes by and you barely survive. And then all of a sudden it's like 8.30, 9 o'clock at night and you're kind of settling things down. And all of a sudden you're like crying too. Like just go to bed so I can go to bed too and we can do it again tomorrow, Right? You're literally in this crazy fog and every day you read something different. You sit there with one article and this article is telling you like, to be a really good parent, 
You can do no discipline. Don't put your kid in time out, no spankings, none of that stuff. Or else when they get older, they're gonna be in therapy for life and they're gonna be really messed up. And you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Then the next day, literally, you go back and you read and you're like, if you don't discipline your kid and put them in time out and spank them and like do all these things, then when they get that old, they're gonna be messed up in therapy for the rest of their life. They're gonna do awful things. And you're like, what do I do? Right? It's a totally different world. So I mean, pause. I wanna ask my friends who are in here, in your late 40s, 50s, 60s, will you just sit down with a young 30-year-old and say, like, it's gonna get better? Even if you're lying, just say it. <laughs> we need to hear it. We need your strength, right? But here's the deal. Your kingdom, your kids aren't yours. So I don't know how many of you guys are living in this life where you're like, oh, they're mine. Like, I have to control all this stuff and it's giving me so much anxiety and so much stress, and I am so overwhelmed. You can love them, you can be a light, you can be a kingdom worker in their life and help them experience and see these things, but they're not yours. And I'm gonna tell you right now, that is so frustrating to us. This is a part of being a kingdom person. When we pray this, your kingdom, your will, we hate this. Because we're like, but I, that isn't the asking part. I need some of that. We... <laughs> You read this in uh, 1 Corinthians. Those of you who've gotten married, you read in 1 Corinthians that um, you read and it says that when you get married, a woman's body is no longer her own, it's the man's. Some guy in here right now is going, it's, it says that in the Bible? <laughs> Hold on, where again? Is it? I need to write this down. This is legit. And women are like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 I get to vote on this. This is a democracy. This is my body. I have authority over it, mm -mm, right? But if you follow that same line down through there, it says that the same happens opposite. That all of a sudden now a man no longer owns his body, that a woman owns it. And the men are like, okay, I guess, fine. Yes, you can have it, <laughs> right? But we hate this stuff, right? We hate anything that's like surrender, giving it all up, not my will, not my kingdom, not my control. And Jesus is teaching us here, right here, this is so important, it's your will, it's your kingdom. We get to say that this is about you, we are surrendering ourselves to our agendas and what's going on. I think that in, in, in this moment, so many of us miss the experience of really uh, experiencing God's presence because we've messed up how and what we're focused on when we're praying and having a conversation with God. And it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter what age you are. And this is a really big topic. I'm gonna try to boil this down really quick. We'll probably talk about this some, some of this stuff later. But when we're praying, we get really messed up when it comes to your will, God's will. What is God's will? And there is a revealed will of God and a hidden will of God. Those are the two types of wills of God. There's a revealed will that we get to see, and we read this like in 1 Thessalonians 4. It talks about the will of God is your sanctification, that God's will is that you will be free, that the chains will be broken from sin, and you will be made right with God. That's the will of God that's been revealed. Or like Romans 8 the, the will of God that you would be in the likeness of his son, Jesus. That you would actually live out life with this transformed heart and care for and love others in the likeness of God's son, Jesus. And then all over the New Testament, a really big word that's attached to the will of God is adoption. That everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome to be adopted into the kingdom of God, that you are a daughter, a son of the king, the creator of the universe. And I think that we miss out, and I've had conversations with friends and even some of you that are missing out on experiencing God fully when we get wrapped up in that. And I talk about like, how are you experiencing God and you're frustrated? I just don't know. I just don't feel like he's close. Like, I feel real dry. I feel this feels real absent. And most often, it's because we're so focused or wrapped up in the hidden will of God. I don't know, I'm just so frustrated, I can't get an answer. Like, who am I gonna marry? Am I ever gonna get married again? What's my job gonna be? What's my future like? Am I gonna have this sickness forever? 
Is his friend gonna be better? Which is all good things that we pray and we give to God because like even talks about like when we can't talk about some of these things, like our spirit actually moans and groans and cries out to the Lord. But we can get so focused on the hidden will of God that we actually miss experiencing because it's hidden rather than focusing on what the revealed will of God and focusing on, wow, there's sanctification that I have been freed, which makes me a new person, a kingdom worker that makes it more about your will and not my will, about your kingdom and how I get to bring that here on earth now and not my kingdom. And there's release in that. And then there's experiencing him in that when it feels absent. Last part of this verse wrap up because it's that time we gotta go. <laughs> your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I realized this week I am, <clears throat> was sitting there processing this and talking about like, how does that actually get lived out on earth now as in heaven? And I remembered it dawned on me back in the last year, November of 21, um, the World Food Program head officer, the CEO of the World Food Program was being interviewed and he called out billionaires. He specifically called out Jeff Bezos of Amazon and Elon Musk and said, you guys can end world hunger. That it would cost $3 billion or $3.3 billion each. And he called them out and said, do it. You guys have the money and the resources. And so then Musk responded publicly and said, prove it and I'll do it. He said, lay out the plan of how that would actually happen with $6 billion, I'll sell stock, and I'll do it. So dude did it. Like the CEO actually went and made this plan, prepared it, and said, I'm opening my books, and then did a public call out. I'm ready, come on down, we're gonna open our books. I can show you, we've actually come with the plan that will show that we can end world hunger for a year with this $6 billion. Like it can actually happen, which then there's this crazy ripple effect that happens. If you can even grasp that we can actually end world hunger for a year and the poverty that comes from that and the sickness that comes from that and all the other things that come from that, right? Laid it out and unfortunately, it hasn't happened yet, right? It, it just hasn't taken place. But what has happened and I've watched uh, in the news in the last couple of weeks is there's lots of chatter because one of these billionaires just bought Twitter, and we can talk about this because we're in the Bay Area, it's local to us, bought Twitter, uh, an online uh, platform to, you know, have our own free speech um, for $44 billion. And what dawned on me this week was like, oh my gosh, $44 billion. That's like almost a decade, like a lot of years of no hunger in the world. So what that did for me is it actually said like, wait a minute, God has actually given us the resources on this earth now to have the kingdom here and to live it out so there wouldn't be hunger. There doesn't have to be shame. There doesn't have to be uh, distinction. There doesn't have to be hurt and judgment and all of those things, that there actually could be a place that's full of love and care and peace and joy and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness, that all these things can actually take place. Then, probably like you, I just get overwhelmed and be like, but I don't have billions of dollars, right? But what it did, and I think it does for all of us, is it shows us that we still get to play a part, that we're here, we're now. And when we pray, our Father in heaven, Hallowed, holy is your name. You can do mighty things. You are a God who is close. And then we say, your kingdom, your kingdom come. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You have invited me into playing a part. And so we friends get to ask, what's my part? Daily, every time we pray, what's my part? And we get to live this out. Uh, praying this frees us to wholly let God be himself completely and do a work in and through us. And we get to live this out, this sanctification, because we have been freed. You've been freed and been made right with God. 
because we have been called and have an opportunity to live in the likeness of Jesus as a light of love. And we have been adopted into the family of the creator of the universe who knew you and knit you and made you and loves you and sees you just as you are. So maybe some of you today or all of us really today get the opportunity to experience communion a little bit differently as we commune with our Father and experience that together. Maybe you just work in these two verses of the Lord's Prayer and you just get to start with, my Father, you are holy, you are gracious, you are good. You're Jireh, you're Jehovah, you're the King of kings, you're the Lord of lords, and you are the Lord of my life, and I'm so thankful that you have sanctified me that I get to live in the likeness of your son, that I've been adopted into your family, and that's what we get to celebrate when we commune and, and have communion together. So in just a moment, you're gonna be able to go freely around the room if you're here in person. You can go on the side of the stage. You can come in the front. And there's a, a cup with some bread <clears throat> underneath the juice. It's two cups in one. And then I would invite you to go back to your space. Maybe you come up over here with your family, your partner, your friends. Maybe you're just by yourself. You physically respond and go up and begin to commune with the Lord and then go find a spot and sit down or circle up somewhere and then take this on your own. But in that moment, maybe it's a part of confession. Father, I, I have been really focused on my will be done. Father, I've been really focused on my kingdom, not your kingdom. Father, I have not been focused on being a kingdom worker, being a person who literally brings the kingdom of heaven to earth now by the way that I live, by the way that I act, by the way that I talk. Father, I have not adored you like I need to adore you. I just need to sit back. Can I just be in your presence and remember? And can I commune with you? Can you scoop me up like a father? And so today, as you commune with your Lord, don't miss out on that moment. And as we're singing, you can respond when you're done taking the juice and the bread and just allow God to do what he does best, to see you right where you're at. Let me pray. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy wonderful, set apart, the creator of all things. God, in this moment, I pray for your kingdom to come and your will be done in this place, in Benicia, in Northgate, in this building as it is in heaven. May we experience your presence as we commune with you. God, thank you for the sacrifice and the bread as we remember the brokenness, our own brokenness and how you broke yourself for us so we can experience you fully. Father, I thank you for the juice and how it represents your blood for our sanctification to free us from ourselves, from our sins. And Father, thank you for adopting us into this moment to being a part of your family. We love you. We love you. You love us so, so much. In your name, amen.